and of course, our uh, guest tonight, a true legend in the industry, Mr. Tom Kalinske. So I, I know, yep. So before we go mute, let's give Tom a big round of applause. We are so happy to have you. Hey, thank you guys. And I'm going to start toasting you because I, I, I managed to make an old fashioned from the recipe that we sent out. I haven't had one in 15 years. So here's to all of you for joining me. Cheers. 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 <laughs> so now I'm going to ask if everybody can mute themselves. So if you just take a minute and find that mute button so that we can uh, make sure that we're always hearing Tom when he's talking. So let me get my bearings here. There we go. So we have to have you mute yourselves because we have sold this thing out. We wanted to have 75 screens and we have, we have blown that out of the water. We have people with us from all over the world. You heard a few of them earlier. They're from California, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Texas, Delaware, New York City, like so many people and countries like Canada and the United Kingdom. So hello to everybody out there. Thanks for getting together and joining us. And of course, we have Tom Kalinske, who we'll meet officially in a few minutes. We also have the Strong's president and CEO, Steve Dubnik, with us. Um, Steve, hello. Hi, everybody. Great to be here tonight. Thank you for joining us and for all you do. And we have benefactors and supporters. We have new friends who are joining us for the first time. And like Tom mentioned before we started, we have trailblazers who worked with Tom at Sega and Mattel over the years. We have college students and professors from the University of Pacific, from CUNY School of Professional Studies, and from Drexel in Philadelphia. So Tom, these people are studying what you achieved and what you do. So I don't, that should make you feel good. That should make you I, feel great. I'm, I'm very, very pleased about that. I'm surprised <laughs> too. <laughs> and they're all excited to be here. So like everything else at The Strong, we want tonight to be fun and interactive. We may have to mute everybody, but we want you to ask questions. You can type them into the chat bar and I'll share them along the way. Just click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, hover over the bottom. It's there, you'll find it. We'll also be plopping other Zoom instructions and tips into the chat. And Miranda from our team is gonna be doing that throughout the night. So now that we have all that squared away, Let's go down to collection storage and see what our co-host, JP Dyson, is up to. JP, how are you? I'm doing great, Lisa, thanks. It's great to be here. And we're standing actually in one of our major collections areas. The Strong houses more than a half a million objects, toys, games, dolls, jigsaw puzzles, and video games. And I think Tom has maybe worked on about half the items in the collection <laughs> over the course of that time. Um, and so we thought it would be a great way just to start off by having you come down here with us. You know, we love to give tours of, of the collection spaces when we can. And so we thought we'd do a little virtual tour here and actually walk down to where I have a few artifacts pulled in, representative of Tom Life. You can see behind me some of the arcade um, machines that we have uh, in our collection. And Chris Pucky from our IT team is going to help me walk backwards. Not only the college students, I hopefully will be able to walk backwards and talk like a college tour and not trip. So we'll see, um, and, and Tom or Lisa, shout out, I'm about to run into an object as I go back. This will not be good curatorial practice at all. But, but I, need to jump, I need to jump in and tell everybody what you do, JP, because yeah. JP Dyson has the coolest job, perhaps not just at the museum, but maybe in the world, because all those 500,000 artifacts, he and his team and the curatorial team get to take care of the world's largest collection of toys, and his exhibits team designs and creates all the interactive exhibits here at The Strong. So he has the coolest job, but also one of the longest job titles in the history of man. JP <laughs> is the Vice President for Exhibits and Director of the International Center for the History of Electronic Games. Yay. <laughs> the job title makes him sound like a lot more important than I am. You have amazing people here who really sort of do creative, uh, innovative things that really symbolize what play is all about, which is about having fun and about learning and about exploring and doing all these things. And we try to do that with the exhibits as well as documenting with the collections. And we learn so much from the toys and the games that we collect here. 
So let's start walking because we want to get back to Tom's story pretty soon. I'm going to start walking back by, and I'll sort of narrate as we go by just some objects as we're going by here. Um, space ball, an early Pong ripoff right there to my right, to my right here. That is, um, you know, Pong was such a success. They said we need to clone it. So Tom, I'm sure you have stories about people cloning yeah. or, or imitating things that you guys came up with. We'll keep going. Robotron, uh, 2084, uh, a popular game. And on my left here, we can keep going. Great. On my left here, our collection storage. So these actually are big vaults that will move. And you turn these and it moves a couple tons worth of storage right here. Um, and you can move four or five at a time. It's a great way to, to host storage compactly. We have a lot of amazing things like um, prototypes. These are a couple of prototypes for the Star Wars game. We have um, over here on my left is Defender, which I know our CEO, Steve Dubnik, wasted too much time playing uh, back in the day. It's sort of a, 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 a gamer's game. Um, if you want to do it. And Asteroids right behind us. This is part of our World Video Game Hall of Fame here uh, at the Strong. So, Chris, we're going to keep going here. And then, um, again, we have some more prototypes over there. And you're coming back to an area where we house all sorts of different things. You're seeing ladders, which we need to get up to some of the upper shelves there as well. And again, more of these shelves here, which housing very long time um, is on the call. And we have an amazing collection of board games that uh, she donated to the museum uh, that she and her husband Andrew played with over the years. And we have back more board games. Chris, I don't know if you can wheel this around in here. You can see one of these storage collections, what they're like. So this is from a uh, gentleman, Darwin Bromley, who is the, um, the, the founder of Mayfair Games. So some of you may know Settlers of Catan. And we can come back to going here. And these are all, every item will get individually numbered and stored. So one of our most important um, responsibilities is keeping track of everything. <laughs> and so we have a whole computer system that does that. Maybe we'll talk about that later. So we're um, coming now to a table where I've gathered a few things. So Tom, I'm going to set you up here in just a minute and start peppering you with questions, and Lisa will too. But before then, now our vice president for collections, you can bring a little bit closer, Chris. Our vice president for collections was insistent that there be no drinks in here. We can't have drinks. In the, in the spaces. So I can't join you uh, with the cocktails. So I searched in our collection and I said, what do we have that's cocktail related? And it turns out we have lots of Barbies and cocktail dresses. <laughs> Every cocktail set that I could find. So, um, but I did find this. Let me grab this quickly. So this is a wind-up toy, a wind-up bartender toy from 1961 from Japan. <laughs> and smoke comes out of his ears. It'll stir your martini. And so I thought, OK, I can't have a drink, but I can at least bring uh, this here with me. And um, so that's, th that's my virtual cocktail assistant right there. Um, there. Yeah, and uh, JP, I don't need a virtual cocktail assistant. Tom, I am making your wife's Cosmo. <laughs> <laughs> so Tom, I've gathered a few things here, and we want to start with your your career, just hearing stories, really. I think you know whichever way you want to take this, we gather some some objects. Sorry about that uh, phone call. I, I'm trying to turn the thing off, but it won't turn off. Yeah, there it goes. Okay. Go ahead, JP. Sorry about that. So I know JP had some uh, questions and he wanted to hear some of the stories you have about working at Mattel. And I think he was going to start out with Barbie and Ruth Handler. Am okay. I right, JP? I think we lost JP. We might have lost JP. That's okay. We have you and we have Barbie and Ruth Handler. <laughs> and by the way, I should tell everybody watching that area that JP is walking through, that's, the, that's an area of collection, but it's not generally where the public goes. The public goes on the upper floors and there they have nice displays for the public to see the Barbie dolls and the American Girl dolls and the Hot Wheels and the Matchbox and the video games and the what have you. But the area he is in is, is really great for guys like me who want to see all this old stuff and, and researchers and students who are interested in that area. Go, now, what was the question? Oh, it was about my time at Mattel with uh, Ruth? Yeah, tell us a little yeah. bit of, about how oh, you got gosh. there. I, I loved Mattel so much. I, I was hired in uh, 1972 and uh, 
uh, I started on preschool toys. Preschool toys back then was CNCs, Jack in the Boxes, wooden putt putt vehicles. Uh, we invented something called Tough Stuff, which we used. They were unbreakable, supposedly, toys, and, uh, and a few other things. And we grew the preschool business pretty nicely. And uh, I was sitting in my cubicle in the, on the sixth floor one day at 5150 Rosecrans in Horathon, California. And of course, I knew Ruth and Elliot pretty well. And Ruth came up and she was agitated. And she said, Tom, Barbie sales declined last year. The retailers say it's over for Barbie. The analysts say it's over for Barbie. My sales force says we should go do something else. What do you think about that? And I said, Ruth, that's the stupidest thing I have ever heard. Barbie will be around long after you and I are gone. She said, that's what I wanted to hear. I'm going to talk to Ray, who was the president, getting you to work on the Barbie business. And of course she did, and he agreed. And uh, before she left my cubicle, I said, Ruth, by the way, why do you think Barbie is so special? And she said, Tom, with Barbie, a girl can be anything she wants to be. And I used that line, or we used it, uh, on packaging and advertising and PR for literally the next 15 years. I think they stopped using it for a while, but they're back using it again. So uh, Ruth's words live on as well as Barbie living on very, very well. And I think this is Mattel's 75th birthday this year. And so what we did was uh, we pulled together some pictures of some of the Barbies we have in our collection. I think Miranda can pull those up. And oh, you brought one too. Which, which one is that? Um, well, you've got better, you've got the old ones there. This is a relatively new one. This is Barbie. We did the, uh, we, we, when I took over the business, we started doing a segmentation and we did low price dolls. We did dolls that uh, were easy for young girls to dress with just Vel Velcro and snaps called My First Barbie. Nice. Uh, we, but we did a lot of occupations. We did Dr. Barbie, veterinarian Barbie. And this one was done after me. But it 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 is uh it is veterinarian it is vet veterinarian Barbie so occupations that uh, were positive and girls yeah. aspi aspired to uh, at one point I think we did President Barbie that hasn't happened yet but it will <laughs> <laughs> Miranda show Tom some of the ones that we pulled that we thought he might enjoy seeing well you've got the first Barbie there that's, that's the right. original Barbie do you, yeah. you want to tell people who that is. Well, on the left, that's the that is the first that is the first Barbie doll. That was the yep. first creation done. Um, Ruth Handler, of course, was the really the inventor uh, uh, of it. That, by the way, is worth a lot of money. <laughs> it's worth more than all the stocks you own. <laughs> <laughs> so that that Barbie was inspired by Build Lily. Yes, by by in in Germany there was a. Yep. Actually, wooden, uh, the first ones were made of wood. I think they changed to plastic later. But that was uh, what inspired Ruth to make a, a full-figured fashion doll that was easy to dress and where the clothes looked beautiful on her. Yep. And people always say, why does Barbie look the way she does? Well, if, you, if she didn't look that way, the clothes would not hang as nicely as they do on a Barbie doll. What else you got, Miranda? And Tom, can I just show you? I have a Bill Lilly here, right here, that I pulled from the collection. Oh my gosh! Oh. No, that's really something too. That's worth a lot of money, also, if it's an original. <laughs> yes, you know, the, the, this is definitely an original. So we have, we have a number of them as well, that's including great. Barbie and Barbie number one and two um, on display in the museum and some of our exhibits. All right, great. So, I know that uh, I know that Miranda has a couple of those professional ones too. She has a astronaut Barbie, I think. Yeah, astronaut was one of the first occupations that we did, actually. And then I think uh, close to Rochester and special to us is that hair, but also Susan B. Anthony. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh. You've got great stuff there. I haven't even <laughs> seen this. JP, what else did you get? What do you have down there? I pull, well, we have whole cabinets full of Barbies, so it's, it's a little bit hard to pick one. So this is actually, uh, this predates you too, Tom. This is from 1961, and this is um, Open Road Barbie. So, so the sort of, which again, the spirit of adventure, and um, um, I love that one. And then um, this one, you may have worked, this is from your time, Tom. This is Sensational Barbie. Was this, <laughs> oh, yeah. It was from your years. Um, and in Rochester, it's been a long winter here. So we're all have this sort of ghostly pallor. So um, <laughs> sensational Barbie sounded like, like a good one. Um, yeah. Was this a whole line of, of Barbie? Like you, do you remember much about these Barbies? Yeah, that, that was, uh, I think, followed Malibu Barbie. And uh, they, they were really basically low, 
priced Barbie dolls. The idea was to get as many into girls' hands as, as we could. And then, of course, they'd have to buy cost fashions and accessories and other things to, for the dolls to be played with in. So you and mentioned accessories. Oh, the camper? Oh, my gosh. And that this was... is the, uh, the Barbie, which I saw this one on the shelf, and I had to pull this one. Oh, yeah. Well, that was really, really successful. Very, very successful. Um, uh, it's part plastic, part vinyl, stay vinyl. Uh, tried to keep it at a relatively low price. So again, that the, the kids could afford it. And, and once they had that, they had to have Barbie, they had to have Ken, they had to have friends, and they had to go camping. Yeah. And that was a very, very successful product. It was actually manufactured initially at, uh, now I'm gonna screw the name up, at our, we had a plant we bought in New Jersey that manufactured that, SP Plastics, was it? Ken Bloom probably remembers. But anyway, uh, uh, that was fantastically successful. Standard plastic products. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> and SP, I was saying, standard, SP, standard plastics products, SPP, right. And, and Tom, I saw someone on the chat ask about Dreamhouse Barbie. Who had the idea from that? Where, you know, where did that come from? Well, and again, when I started on the brand, I wanted to, uh, it, initially, we weren't doing big, huge houses. And I wanted us to have a big house. So the first one we did wasn't as big as the Dream House. It was called the Town House. Mm -hmm. And it was probably a $20, $25 product. But the dream house was sensational. It was really special and it was large. And the initial ones back uh, when I was there were probably $50. Today, they're a hundred mm. and uh, lots of, lots of rooms, lots of places for, for, of course, you could buy it either furnished or unfurnished. Well, initially the price was so high, <laughs> nobody bought it furnished. So they bought it unfurnished and then they would add furniture to it. And uh, it was a razor, razor blade strategy. It was really like much like what we do in the video game industry. You have that, that big thing and you've got to then fill it with other products. And so, uh, again, wildly successful product. So on, on another side of Mattel, Tom, we had somebody who asked if you had any involvement on the Intellivision side of things. And have you seen how the brand is being brought back? Yeah, well, uh, initially, uh, initially, Mattel Electronics was part of the toy division. And we did the handheld electronics first. Uh, there was a group down in preliminary design that, that did the handheld electronics, the racing game and a football game and, a, and a, a tank game. And then out of that same group, yo, you've got one there. Good <laughs> you. I don't have those. And then, uh, and then out of that same group, they developed the idea of doing in television. Remember Atari now was the king of the row. They, Nolan Bushnell had started Atari and, and in television was started by, by, um, uh, a group, uh, Richard Chang down in preliminary design and uh, uh, Daglo, uh, you know Daglo, who's on, very much involved with the Strong Museum and, uh, and Mike Katz and uh, Jeff Rockless and uh, a guy named Krakauer. And they, they developed in television and uh, it, initially it was under the toy division, but the CEO of the Total Corporation decided that it was such an important business, they should move it down the road into a separate building and they took it away from the toy division. Oh. And that kind of, frankly, that kind of upset me a little bit. I, I, I would have rather be, been able to still manage it. And uh, anyway, uh, no, no crying over spilt milk, but, uh, but you, eventually, go ahead. But you did get to manage my personal favorite, Masters of the Universe. Oh yes, yes. Well, remember in those days, oh, I love that t-shirt. In those days, uh, Hasbro had Star Wars and G.I. Joe and Mattel did not have much of a male action business. We had a big gym, which was not a very big brand. And it did better in Europe than it did in the US. And, uh, and we, had, we did license uh, Battlestar Galactica. And we had, so we had a little bit of male action business, but nothing to speak of. And we were desperate to find a male action line. And so it was one of the big efforts in the company both from a preliminary design R&D standpoint, but also from a market research standpoint. I mean, we looked at every license conceivable. We looked at, uh, at, uh, at uh, the Marvel characters. We looked at the DC characters. We thought about things like policemen and firemen and what have you, uh, detectives and Dick Tracy even. But none of that resonated. And uh, the, the preliminary design group run by Derek Gable, who I think is on this call, and a guy who worked for him named Roger Sweet came up with He-Man and Masters of the Universe. He-Man, and I've got He-Man here somewhere. Here's He-Man. Bring him on. Sure yeah. You've got it there as well. Uh, He-Man and Skeletor, and of course He-Man. 
uh, the storyline, uh, this big muscular guy, you can tell he actually was sculpted after me. Those are about the size of my muscles. Wait, wait, I, I, I think we have proof of that. Miranda, don't you have an old <laughs> photo of Tom Kalinske on the cover of a magazine? Oh God. I'm pretty sure you do. Yep, yep, I see, I see, I see the likeness, I see it. <laughs> Gee, I had hair back then, uh, <laughs> or at least blonde hair. Um, that was when I was at Sega, obviously. That yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, the guys developed this brand, and it researched through the roof against anything you put it against. It didn't matter whether you put it up against G.I. Joe or Star Wars. Boys loved the idea of He-Man and his sword. You know, it was actually Prince Adam, and when he raised his sword and said, I have the power, he changed into the most powerful man in the universe. And he had his cast of characters, a whole bunch of good guys, that like Man of War and Merman, and uh, I'm going to forget a bunch of them. And then, of course, the enemies were Skeletor, who was a bad guy, looked had a skull head. You got that there, at JP? Yes, we do. We have Skeletor right here, yes. Yeah, I have him here somewhere, too. And then Castle Grayskull was this big plastic play environment, where they fought it out. And uh, of course, the idea was there's Castle Grayskull. <laughs> so it was, it was a good versus evil story, kind of a timeless storyline of good fighting evil. And again, with uh, He Man, when he had the power, he could defeat almost anybody. And he had his pet, uh, his pet, uh, I was going to say tiger, but I think it was actually more like a leopard. And he, his long lost sister, came into the storyline later on. She was, a, I think her name was Adorna. And uh, she was actually part of the evil horde, which was uh, a, a part of Skeletor's reign. But when she realized that she was uh, Prince Adam's uh, sister, He-Man's sister, she changed to becoming She-Ra and she decided to go with the good guys. So that, that was, it, that's a really quick summary of a, of a very long story. But we always had that storyline in, in, uh, involved in the, in the, with the characters. And it's a kind of a funny thing because we were doing about 75 million in, in revenue, which wasn't bad, you know, it wasn't terrible. And the chairman of the company walked in my office, a guy named Art Spear, and he said, well, he was kind of a crotchety guy. He said, well, it's nice you're doing 75 million but you'll never be as important as Star Wars because you, you can't get a TV show or a movie. And I said, you want to bet art? <laughs> and uh, there's Castle Grayskull again. Yes. So I hired a guy named Eddie Smarden who'd worked in television and he started working with Filmation Studios run by a guy named Lou Scheimer. Filmation in those days did a lot of animated shows. And we came up with a budget. It was going to cost seven and a half million dollars to do a 65 half hour a series of, of shows. And our, our idea was we would get Mattel to pay half of that and Group W Westinghouse, which had TV stations across the country to pay half of that. Well, they agreed. And then we did something that had never been done before. We gave the show away free to all of these stations around the country. And of course, they loved that. And in return, we got, adver we got spots back, 30 second spots back, which we couldn't use for He-Man, but we could use for He-Man, or excuse me, for Hot Wheels or other products, or we could sell. And we ended up selling a lot of them to McDonald's and Kellogg's and the shoe companies and what have you. And the show rated so highly that we actually made a profit off of the television show and got our three and a half million that we'd invested in the television show paid back rather quickly. And of course the show went on to be a sensational hit and guys inside of Mattel read every script and approved every script. And at the end of every show, there was a moral positive message, you know, don't be a bully, don't hit your little sister, don't steal, you know, st simple things like that. But the show was very, very popular. It ran for, we did another 65 half hours. We, so we ended up doing 130 in total in syndication. And it ended up going around the world. And it, it still is on in, some, in some, some markets. And finally, I heard from Mattel just a few weeks ago, they are reintroducing the original He-Man next year. So I'm very happy about that. Who's that? <laughs> Anyway, um, so that's a little bit of the He-Man Masters of the Universe story. Uh, by the way, the business soared to 700 million and it was a huge, huge success for Mattel. And I'm really happy they're bringing it back. And, and it, 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 oh, 
No, I was going to say, and it was an international hit because we have guests, a guest from India who's saying that he grew up in India in the 80s and it was super popular in India and it was a big hit there. Yeah, I get, it's a funny thing. I get mail still from all over the world. And a lot of times, these are obviously adults now. These aren't necessarily young children. They're, they're adults who had played with He-Man back in the, in the 80s in whatever market they're in. And they'll send me a, a, a part of a package or something and ask me to autograph it and send it back to them. And as much of, as much of the time as I can, I do. But it's, it's amazing how popular it still is today. I mean, you know, Barbie's lasted forever and I'm hoping He-Man will last forever as well. Me too. <laughs> what did you have, JP? Well, a little bit off He-Man. I actually wanted to ask a question first about that. You know, Tom, was that this idea of transmedia, of going between different products, was He-Man really a pioneer um, in that, in terms of influencing other shows like Transformers and that sort of thing? Oh yeah, abs absolutely. Uh, and, and Eddie Smarden, the guy we'd hired, who was an expert in TV, he actually helped, uh, I think, Bandai get the, um, oh gosh, what was the name of their Transformer competitive product line? He helped them. Robots? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so this was one of the first things that had, it had never been done before, where you gave it away free and got advertising time back for, for it. There were, obviously were, were shows that were sponsored by toy companies. I mean, at Mattel, we, we worked with uh, American Greeting on, on, uh, on uh, Popples. We worked with, uh, with uh, Hallmark on, uh, on Rainbow Bright. Uh, we worked with a number of, of different companies uh, that had television shows and in some cases we helped them get it on air in other cases they already already had it on air so, so i just had a quick question this is mod hair ken from 1973 <laughs> yes i worked on that <laughs> and so my question was is this modeled on your hairstyle at the time is this oh yeah absolutely only he's not as muscular as i was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then one more I know we probably want to move on beyond Mattel, but I've heard you also talk about the Sunshine um, Fun oh, Family. Oh um, well, gosh, well, the Sunshine so. Family was Mattel, and and I really loved the Sunshine Family. Uh, it was created by a couple folks at Mattel, a, a gal named Virginia Sargent, very creative gal, and I actually had a big hand in that one uh, and wrote a lot of the stuff for it. Uh, we had a little craft book included that where the the idea was this was a family, a man, a, a husband and wife, two kids wedding ring on the dad's fingers, and the, a craft book included where the children would make things for the, chil the, the doll children out of things like a strawberry basket, a toilet paper roll, stuff that was around the house, and, uh, and build an environment for them out of materials. It was very environmentally conscious way back then. Wasn't a huge, huge, huge hit, but I was very, very proud of it. So one of our guests, Tom, um, just came in a little late and asked if Mattel football was already covered. Yeah. And <laughs> so one of the cool things that you might like, Tom, and Scott might like, our guest, is that maybe, and JP, correct me if I'm wrong, you with me? Are you thinking about doing an oversized Mattel football, maybe? Yeah, we, we are. So we're doing a big uh, 90, uh, $65 million expansion. Sorry, Lisa, I almost just raised it by uh, a <laughs> million dollars. Um, it's a 90,000 square foot expansion. And uh, two, uh, some of the major exhibits are related around video games, history of video games, and how they're impacting a society. And one of the, the neat things at the museum we can do with things is sometimes play with things, you know, scale them up. And so one of the ideas we're looking at is doing a giant oversized Mattel football. That oh, you wow. two people cool. play at the same time. Right. Um, and so this is sort of fun experience. Oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and so we are we're gonna do something like that, I think, in the upcoming expansion. So that's a that's a fun area. Now from Mattel, you then went to Matchbox, right? And you mentioned uh, you mentioned Mac Matchbox earlier. Oh, what do you have, Tom? What is that? Just a matchbox package, just so everybody remembers what they look like. Yep. I do have a pretty good collection of both Hot Wheels and Matchbox down in my basement. Do you have a preference? Oh, gosh. <clears throat> <laughs> well, with Ken on the line, I probably shouldn't say, but I have to say Hot Wheels. <laughs> JP, which one got into the Toy Hall of Fame first? Uh, Hot Wheels did get in the Toy Hall of Fame first, and I was always a Matchbox fan, I will say that, 
And actually, I brought in from a collection a couple of things. These are some of the original ones. Yeah, I have that too down in my basement. From the 1950s here. Yeah. This is, um, and then you can see why they're named matchboxes. They actually come in the little matchbox there as well. And this one, Tom, um, is from, I think, 1989. So probably one when you were there then at the, at the time. And when we were prepping for the show, you were telling about um, the experience, you were telling a story about Spain and about the, the experience <laughs> of, uh, of doing it. You want to share that? Oh, gosh. Well, that's a, that's a strange story. Uh, Matchbox was in receivership when David Ye bought it, and I helped him uh, get it out of receivership, and we ended up uh, on the New York Stock Exchange, strangely, strangely enough. And, but we had a lot of issues, and there were a lot of the issues were, were, well, they were around the world, basically. We had management issues in a lot of different places. But one of the stories that I, I didn't really tell many people back in the day, uh, except for David Ye, the, the chairman of the company, but I was, I was on a tour of our European offices, and I, I'd been to Germany, I'd obviously been to the UK, which was really the heart of, of, uh, of Matchbox. And that, that's kind of, by the way, an interesting story too. When, when I was at, at Mattel, we had thought about buying Matchbox because it was in receivership. But one of the stipulations by the creditors in the UK, this is the banks and the retailers and the union and what have you, was you had to keep a die casting plant open in the UK in Enfield, it was in, just outside of London in Enfield where the rifles were made. And of course, Mattel, we, we couldn't agree to keeping a die cast plant open in the UK. That's crazy. It just the cost of doing that was just too much. Well, David agreed to do it. And then later when I joined in with him, he told me to close it. But anyway, <laughs> while I was trying to flying around uh, Europe, I ended up in Spain and I guess I got there a day early and I don't speak Spanish very well at all, but I had a Matchbox card and uh, the driver of the taxi said, oh, Matchbox, Matchbox. And he, he took off and away we went. And we went to this industrial area uh, and I went in and it was, it was um, nap time, basically, uh, lunch time. Yeah. And there was nobody there at the front desk. And, I, and it was literally an empty kind of little small lobby. And I opened a door to go further in and there were die cast machines, injection molding machines, and they're, they're making matchbox cars. And uh, I thought, I didn't know anything about this because all of our manufacturing, I thought, was in China and Macau and Enfield, UK. Well, anyway, so nobody there except for a couple guys working the machines who didn't know anything and I couldn't speak Spanish. So I, I went out back in the lobby and I got on a phone. I figured out how to use my credit card phone number at the time. And I called David back in Hong Kong. I said, David, I'm standing in our manufacturing plant in Barcelona, Spain. And he said, we don't have a manufacturing plant in Barcelona, <laughs> Spain. I said, well, I'm standing in it and I can see them making stuff and there's matchbox packaging and it's going out the door. And he said, Tom, I think you better get the hell out of there because it's obviously an illegal operation. <laughs> and it was, and I got out of there and we got a lawyer and we got police and we got the thing shut down. But a, kind of a strange things happen in the toy industry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Matchbox was sort of an interlude a little bit in some ways. I don't know, maybe that's not a fair statement, but you went from, from Mattel to Matchbox and then on to Sega. Sega. Yeah. And, and actually, the, that happened exactly. Yeah. The chairman of, of Sega, we had such, we really fixed Matchbox up in, in Europe and also to a great extent in the United States. But in Europe, we had really good distribution after a few years. And uh, the, the chairman of Sega, wanted us to handle the 8-bit master system in Europe. And I took a look at it. And remember, I knew what Intellivision looked like, and I knew a little bit what NES 8-bit uh, Nintendo looked like. And I looked at master system from Sega, and I, and I wasn't that impressed. And so I turned him down. So, but I did know him, obviously. So I, after we had uh, we decided to sell uh, uh, Matchbox, and I, I left, uh, and I was on a vacation in Hawaii. And the chairman of, of Sega, Hayao Nakayama, tracked me down on a beach and showed up. I'm there with my kids and my wife. And he, he starts talking to me about joining Sega. And I'm like confused. How did he find me? What is he talking <laughs> about? And he says, you've got to come back to Japan with me and look at what is called 16-bit technology and a color handheld device that ended up becoming uh, Game Gear. And initially I resisted, but my my 
daughter, one of my daughters, I have six children. My, my daughter at the time who was six years old said, daddy, he came all the way from Japan. You got to go with him. I flew back to, to Japan and, and he was right. I was very, very impressed by 16 bit, what we ended up calling Genesis in the United States and they called Mega Drive in Europe. And uh, I was also very, very impressed with Game Gear because remember, Nintendo had Game Boy, which sort of was sort of was gray and white or green and white. And here was a full color LCD screen with beautiful games. And uh, I thought this was just spectacular. And I thought, by God, we've got a chance at taking on Nintendo. And, and JP has it right there. I see it. JP's yeah. got the Game yeah, this, Gear. This is the, um, this is the Game Gear. This is actually the Japanese version. Yeah. So one of the things we have in the collection, we have more than 8,000 Japanese console games, like from Japan, console games and the consoles. But this is, yeah, this is the one that has the, uh, the, the sort of fruit sorting game, a little bit like Ted, you can see that on there, uh, yeah. like Tetris. And, yeah. just, and they showed you this, right? When you went there. At, at, yes, at the exactly, lab. exactly, exactly. And, uh, and it really, it was a, it's a terrific product. It, the only negative with it was it chewed up batteries. You, really, you had to replace <laughs> batteries quite frequently with it, either that or plug it into and use an adapter and plug it into a wall socket. But, but anyway, it was a, a terrific product. And but the combination of, of Genesis and Game Gear, we ended up, uh, we were correct in our assumption. We ended up passing Nintendo and share of market, according to the Nielsen Research Group. And, uh, and, uh, it was just a phenomenal, phenomenal time. We grew, we grew Sega from, I think it was 72 million when I joined to a billion and a half in the US and about 900 million in Europe. JP, what do you, and, and that's incredible, Tom. And that's why I think people are so enthralled with your career and all the things you've done. So, so I have I, the Genesis right there. Oh yeah. Yep, yep. And I, I think Miranda has a little, um, a little video, a little commercial clip that might spark some. Oh, what do you have? Hold on. Well, I just, you know, we can't leave out Sonic the Hedgehog. I mean, of all of the yeah. brands that I've worked on, this is another one of my very, very favorites. This is Sonic yeah. CD, which we did on our, our CD uh, accessory. And uh, and actually, oh no, you're gonna show a video there? Yeah, I think Miranda had a had a kind of throwback commercial for you. What's the hottest 16-bit video game system with true arcade games, great graphics, real challenge, stereo sound, and the hottest library, too, with games like Altered Beast, Golden Axe, Super Hang-On, Forgotten Worlds, Space Harrier 2, Revenge of Shinobi, Tommy Lasorda Baseball, Buxton, Last Battle, Arnold Palmer Tournament Golf, Super Thunder Blade, Zoom, Thunder Force 2, Ghouls and Ghosts, Mystic Defender, Rambo 3, and more, Genesis from Sega. Genesis, the new generation in video games. <laughs> Sega does what Nintendo don't. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, so Tom, you mentioned Sonic. Actually, someone on the chat asked, um, you know, when did you first learn about Sonic? And I know there's a story there between which game was packaged with it, whether it was Sonic or, or Altered Beast. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Well, very soon after I, I joined Sega, we developed a, you know, a strategy of we were going to leave the, uh, the young kids business to Nintendo and we were going to try to do an older, uh, attractive products to teenagers and college age kids. So a lot of our effort was in that area. But we also knew Nintendo had Mario and we needed our own character. And people had suggested characters that existed in the Sega library like Alex the Kid and some other things. But we felt, I felt we really needed a stronger character. And so did Al Nielsen. I don't know if Al's on the call yet. But anyway, the group at uh, Sega of America were pressing uh, Sega Japan to develop characters. And so they came up with a couple alternatives and uh, Al took a look at them and, and Madeline Canapa Schroeder, who may be on the call, I don't know, and Diane Fournassier, I saw she was going to be on the call. And, and uh, the one that stood out was this strange hedgehog, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, uh, versus the other alternatives, which frankly weren't very attractive. And so we really pushed for the development of it. And the guys in Japan did a sensational job developing Sonic the Hedgehog. And the, the, the speed with which he could move and the way he looked. Uh, initially, the look was a little bit too aggressive. Uh, the original look, he had fangs, you know, like <laughs> big fangs. And he had very sharp spikes on him. And he had a girlfriend named Madonna who was quite busty <laughs> in the rock group. 
<laughs> and we decided that wasn't going to work in the U.S. market, and we we tamed him down. We didn't want the fangs. He wanted we wanted him to be friendlier and nicer and and more of the so, kind of the hard aleck so teenager. So there's and, a tradition with redesigning Sonic. You did it back in the day, and it happened again in modern day. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, so anyway, and then I, I went to Japan and I said, okay, we're going to include Sonic the Hedgehog in with the hardware. And they said, oh, you're crazy. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a very profitable title and we don't make money on the hardware. So if you put it in with the hardware, we won't make profit either on the hardware or the software. So that's crazy. I said, yes, but we'll sell a lot more hardware. And this is a razor, razor blade business. We've got to get more consoles out in the marketplace. And the game was so strong that players bought the hardware just to play Sonic the Hedgehog. So it was, it was one of several things we did that worked really, really well. And then of course, later on, we did two television series, having learned how to do television series on characters. We did a, we did a network series on Saturday morning for Sonic the Hedgehog, and we did a slightly different series, syndicated after school every day, Monday through Friday, uh, and both were very, very successful, and both again are still running in some markets. Tom, I have a really big question from a, from a guest. Um, Charles says, I'm curious what it was like being the head of Sega during that time, particularly around the launch of Mortal Kombat and the political implications from that game with Lieberman and Clinton and ultimately the ESRB. Did yeah. any of that stuff filter down to you? Oh, gosh, yes. I was obviously very involved in that. And remember, again, as part of the strategy to go after an older audience, I realized we had to do games that would appeal to teenagers mm -hmm. and college and adult players, not just to young children. And my analogy was we wanted to be like the movie industry. You have G-rated movies, you have PG movies, you have PG-13 movies, and you have R-rated movies. Yep. And I actually met with Jack Valenti, who ran the Motion Picture Association back in those, those days. And I, and I said, Jack, we in the video game industry would like to use the motion picture rating system. And he basically laughed at me. He said, we're not going to let you guys, the video game industry, use our system. And so I had to hire my own team. And I hired a guy named Ar Dr. Arthur Pover, uh, who I'd worked with in the toy industry in the past, and he hired sociologists and child development experts and psychologists and everybody under the sun to develop a rating system for video games. And these, the, they would sit in a group and they would evaluate each video game and assign a rating to it. Uh, again, we, we copied the Motion Picture Association a little bit. We didn't do it exactly, but we did G-rated and we did T for teen rated and we did uh, M13 for, for over over yep. 13 years of age and and anyway it, it the sega system later and of course we had to rate a number of our titles as uh as over for over 13 and certainly mortal Kombat was was one of them and i obviously did have mixed mixed feelings on this we we did the game the way it was originally designed for in the arcade where you had real blood and nintendo chose not to show real blood they showed green gore when a, a good <laughs> character would cut a bad character and and you'd see green gore coming out. I was like, what the hell is green gore? Nobody has green gore on them. And so doing, it turned out that uh, doing the original version, we outsold the Nintendo version by something like 10 to 1. And even the head of uh, the chairman of, of Nintendo back in those days, Howard Lincoln, he admitted to me later, he thought he really had, they really had us. They, you know, they had the, they got, they talked to their Senator to, to, uh, to start the hearings on the video game industry. And they thought they really had us because of this uh, Mortal Kombat episode. Well, as the, the hearings didn't work quite the way he, uh, Howard expected them to, because the guy we sent, Bill White, who used to work at Nintendo, knew that Nintendo also had a gun in their uh, series for shooting at the screen with. So he pulled that out in the hearings and there was a shouting match going on. And anyway, the net, net of it all was after the hearings, the video game industry realized not only did they everybody need to use a rating system, but we needed our own software association. We couldn't rely on the then software association, which was mainly Microsoft and, and Oracle and business software. We had to have our own video game software association. So we started the, what was initially called the IDSA, the Interactive Digital Software Association. They later changed, changed the, the name to the, just the, the, uh, the entertainment software. Yeah. Uh, and so that exists today. The video, the rating system exists today. And again, I'm, I'm very proud to have been part of getting a rating system done 
and getting a video game association done. And be, out of that, we started the E3 show in Los Angeles instead of going to the consumer electronics show where you're competing with all the computers and the new phones and the new TVs and the new stereo equipment and the new yep. car stuff. Uh, instead, we have our own show dedicated solely to the video game industry, which initially the retailers absolutely loved. They loved getting out of that CES thing where it was just too hectic and being able to focus, at least the buyers who worked on video games, focus on video games. And so one of our, one of our guests wants to know, how did the third party publishers react when you introduced the Sega rating system? It depended. Uh, guys like Electronic Arts actually, yeah. were, who we, we became very close to, they embraced it immediately. Uh, Tengen embraced it immediately. Acclaim embraced it immediately. Uh, Sony, which wasn't doing much in, in video games back in those days, they were just yep. starting to, they embraced it immediately. But there were some that said, what do we need this for? You know, we don't want to have anybody looking and putting a rating on our games. So there was a bit of a, a, bit of a struggle with some of the third, the third parties, but yep. eventually everybody got on board with it. And JP, you got something there. What do you got? Well, I pulled the um, that, you know, <laughs> that issue and I pulled the original magazine from our archives. So we have about 30,000 video game and computer magazines here at the museum. And I just want to read, if I could, what it says about Tom. Tom has a chance to embarrass you here right now. Um, it's, it's positive, don't worry. Um, they saw the Tom as Gamer of the Year in 1994. And it says, um, this is merely confirmation of the status that this visionary energetic CEO has already earned with his peers in the general public. No executive has had a greater or more positive impact than gaming this decade. As president and chief executive of Sega of America, and as an ethical and idealistic individual, no one has made more outstanding contributions to contemporary electronic gaming. So there it is back in 1994. Wow. That's, I'm going to have to read that. I forgot that. <laughs> but that's a great follow up. That's a great introduction to another question a guest, a guest had. So they praise your accomplishments. A guest wants to know, what are you most proud of? Oh, gosh. That is so hard for me to answer. <laughs> you know, I, it depends. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of, of being able to be, have been part of, of uh, Barbie and Masters of the Universe is something that we accomplished at, at, at Mattel and the fact that they're lasting, they have this long life, but also of, of Sega and, and the, uh, the, what we did with the video game industry. When I joined the video game industry, it was a three and a half billion dollar total industry. When I left, it was about seven and a half billion, but we had started the pathway to become all ages. And by the way, we also had a, a number of games for women and women started playing video games, which they're still doing in great numbers today. And the Strong is very, very, very proud to have our Women in Games initiative that really promotes and, yes. and publicizes all those accomplishments. Yes. And at, at Sega, we had a number of, as you know, senior women in management, which no other company had. Uh, Diane Frenassier, Ellen Beth Van Buskirk, um, uh, Michael and Christine Risley. Uh, we, had a, we had a couple of of producers who were who were who were who were female, which no no other company really had. I don't think maybe Sierra did, and uh, for for uh, uh, they were pretty game. cool. Though. But <laughs> but it was it was really uh, is really something. And today the video game industry at 150 ish billion dollars is twice the size of the movie and music industries combined. So take that, Jack Valenti, not letting. <laughs> So somehow, Tom, we only have 10 minutes left. I don't know how yeah. this happened. <laughs> but um, JP, did you have one more thing you wanted to show? Because I really want to make sure we ask Tom yeah. about why play and why are you involved with the strong? So okay. I'm going to let JP show one more thing. All right. And then I'm going to make you answer that, that question. <laughs> so I was going to do another Sega thing, but one, I, I think we really want to just at least touch it a little bit on your time with Knowledge Universe and Leapfrog and give you a chance to talk about that. So if you be, so if you want to talk about that while simultaneously also thinking about Lisa's question about the strong too. Mm -hmm. I, I, I will do that. Uh, I obviously, uh, I, uh -huh. I, for, a, for a long time, I was able to make the decisions for the United States market, the Western world at Sega. But in about 1995, that started to change. 
And I couldn't understand why, because we had a 55% share of the video game market in the United States. And in Japan, they had a 12% share. But anyway, they decided they could make the decisions for the United States. And they started taking that ability away from me. And uh, I knew it was, it was time to, to get on and go do something else. And I was being pursued at that time by Mike Milken, who, by the way, had refinanced Mattel back in the 80s when Atari uh, television collapsed. And, uh, and Larry Ellison, who lives up here near me, or he did then, he's moved a little further away now, like to Hawaii. But anyway, uh, they wanted to use technology to improve education, uh, cradle to grave, literally. And they each invested $250 million. So I became CE, I was hired by them. I became CE, and I liked the idea of using technology to improve education. We had a product that they had called Pico, which we don't talk about much, but it was really the child's first computer. And it was an educational product connected to a television set. And, and, and it really worked very, very well, helping kids learn to read and learn a few other subjects. So I joined with, with uh, Mike and Larry, and I was CEO of this company with $500 million. And we did 36 companies over the next nine years, half of them young kids business, half of them probably in computer training and higher ed and that sort of thing. But anyway, one of them was LeapFrog, which we bought when it was doing 3 million in revenue from a guy named Mike Wood, the founder, who is a great guy. He really believed in phonics education, using phonics to help kids learn to read. And um, we turned it into a very rapidly growing business. It became a, a $680 million business in short order. Uh, we had a number of Toy of the Year awards back in the, in the early uh, uh, 96, 97 period of time. Uh, and we had, of course, our own characters again. This is Little Leap here. And uh, the, the, the characters also became very popular in our, in our games. Basically, we were focused on, on teaching reading to young kids, teaching early math skills, and teaching a little bit of science and a little bit of music. And it, it was just a great experience for me. And it, it, again, it proved that technology, at least I felt then, could really help kids learn better, faster, uh, and effectively. So Tom, I, I expected all the, the fan comments in the chat bar about Sega and all the Mattel products, but you, you should see and look at all the fan comments about LeapFrog. It's really fabulous to see how people really believe in the power of play and education. And I didn't think there'd be a whole lot of fans for LeapFrog, but there are, and that's pretty, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. It's a it's a very popular yeah. Uh, yeah and and back to your question you know I believe in play I and we've talked about this before I mean Maria Montessori said play is how children uh, uh, work is is work is is how they learn to work and yep. for me play is is how children learn period and it's what makes us human it's what makes us uh, uh, learn to get along with one another. And so I'm a huge believer in the power of play and the importance of play. And that's why I'm involved with the strong and why I'm trying to help you guys out as, as much as I can <laughs> and, and get other people involved with the strong museum. And, and I, I, I wish I could get there more. This, this is a bad year. We couldn't travel. No, but I love when I can get to go to the strong and, and walk through the exhibits and see all these wonderful toys and the place and the children and watching how they can play with all this stuff and all these hands-on places that you have for them. And then, of course, I do love the video game part, too, where you've got basically everything that ever existed <laughs> in the world of video games. <laughs> so uh, looking forward to seeing the expansion. I know you need the expansion, given how many more video games have been created in the last couple of years. Yep, yep, yep. So, Tom, we have five minutes left. Um, I want to give a few minutes for people to ask additional questions and see if we missed anything. So, oh, there's a big one. This one was, this one was complicated, ready? Uh-huh. I'm just going to read it. Okay. Sega passed on the Silicon Graphics Technology Partnership that eventually became Nintendo 64. In the alternate universe where Sega partnered with SGI, what direction would you have taken with the tech and in what ways would you have leveraged that opportunity if you had made that decision? Boy, that must have been asked by somebody who knows the insides <laughs> of that, graphics. So I was, uh, this is at the time when 
when Sega Japan was developing the Saturn, which was the next platform after the Genesis. And my head of R&D guy, great guy named Joe Miller, and he convinced me that he didn't think Sega was the best platform or the best chipset in the world and thought we could do better. And at the same time, I had gotten to, I had gotten to, to, uh, to know the chairman of Silicon, Silicon Graphics. And he called me up, Jim Clark, by the way, who mm -hmm. later founded Netscape. And okay. Jim, Jim called me up and he said, hey, and we knew each other. And he said, hey, I've got, we've got a chipset here that I think is fantastic for video games. It was developed by a guy named, a guy named Jun, Jun Sun Wang, who, by the way, later founded NVIDIA, which is now a- Ah, in the news too, yeah. And, uh, and so I, uh, I went up to see it and Joe came with me and we really liked it. It was a very, it, it, it produced, Silicon Graphics is known for their high-end graphics computers that they're, they're mm -hmm. used for lots of special effects. A lot of them, they sell a lot of these machines to the movie industry and what have you. And this was just a fantastic, I thought it was a fantastic uh, technology. And it allowed for better graphics than what Saturn had. It allowed for better music than what Saturn had. And uh, so I called Japan, said, hey, you got to come on, take a look at the Silicon Graphics uh, chip. And they did, they came over and their evaluation of it was that it was, it was too, con too big of a chip, that there would be too much waste in manufacturing, and therefore they were gonna stick with their original plan, which was two different ch chipsets in, in the Saturn. So Jim Clark called me up after I had relayed this message to him, and he said, well, what should I do now? And I said, well, Jim, there's this other company up north in Seattle you might wanna talk to. So I'm actually the guy who sent the SGI chipset up to Nintendo because I, you know, I had a responsibility. I'd, this this thing needed to exist. I, I have another hard tech question. Different topic. Do you regret canceling the Sega VR headset? No, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> uh, the VR technology we were working on, while it sounded great, there was a real big drawback. Most people who put the headset on, and we had this connected to a Genesis again, the Genesis wasn't powerful enough to really do VR properly. Mm -hmm. And you would either have a reaction where you got dizzy and fell down, or you would get sick to your stomach and throw up. So given those two, <laughs> two choices, not many people enjoyed their VR. Or both, or, or both of the above? <laughs> I did both, I think. <laughs> So I, I know we didn't get to everybody's questions and, and it's, we, we eventually do just run out of time, but I do want to thank you for joining us tonight, everybody. And Tom, I, I, I very much want to thank you for being here. Uh, we are so grateful for everything you do. We're so grateful for your advances in the industry and for you being a friend of the museum. Um, to all of our guests, if you like what you learned about the Strong National Museum of Play tonight, please come back and watch more episodes. Come and visit us. Um, consider becoming an annual supporter. Uh, the museum needs the support of donors and friends to help make all the programs that we highlighted tonight possible. Tom, we have one more little surprise for you. And it's not something that the museum did. It's something that all these attendees did for you. So mm -hmm. when we send out our email, we asked them if they could share pictures of themselves or their children or their friends playing with the toys that you helped to create. And we have a little slideshow of the pictures that they shared. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> what Skeletor do? <laughs> Oh, oh wow. Diane. Well, there's Diane and, and yep. Evie with me at Toy Fair last year or year before. Say Sonic. Oh, yeah, we didn't talk about Flintstones. Okay, that's what got me in children's business. <laughs> Hi, Lizzie. I love that one. I know her. EB again. <laughs> This is actually one of our volunteers at the museum. Oh, wonderful. And she said she practically lived in this. Princess of power. Yep. She-Ra. <laughs> and there's He-Man. He-Man. <laughs> <Sorry. Daniel. laughs>
Oh. <laughs> Finally defeated. <laughs> oh. Well, it's a combination. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, Tom. Do you have any final thoughts for us? Well, I, I do. I just, again, I would encourage everybody who can to visit the Strong because it is such a special place and you will love it and you will you will want to go back again and again. Uh, nothing like it exists anywhere else in the world that I'm aware of. Um, so anyway, thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you for honoring me with your questions and uh, and let's uh, let's keep it up. All right, Miranda, play us out. <laughs> Thank you, JP. Oh my gosh. Thank you, JP. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, JP. See you soon, I hope. Yes. Right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. <laughs>